So welcome to the 10th in a series of free webinars hosted by the Chamber of Commerce under the theme Supporting Businesses in a Time of Crisis. I'm Will Pinot, the Chief Executive of the Chamber of Commerce. The topic of this webinar is COVID-19, the impact on technology. And today we are partnering with BDO, a company specializing in cybersecurity and business continuity. The object of this meeting is to help businesses and individuals understand the technology risks involved in working remotely and how to address or mitigate these risks, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. This webinar will provide important information about where to start in assessing and addressing cybersecurity risks, possible sources of new attacks, what should be your, what should be your top information security priorities and how to accommodate a new mobile workforce while remaining secure. Our presenter for today's session is Richard Carty. Richard is a Risk Advisory Services Director, Data Privacy, Security, Governance, Risk, and Compliance at BDO. He is an industry leader in the Risk Advisory Services sector, matched by a working knowledge of significant business trends, such as regulatory compliance, data privacy and protection, cybersecurity, governance, risk, and compliance, internal and external audit, and an ability to relate these trends to clients, businesses, and risk profiles. Richard has more than 20 years combined experience across various industries, financial services, insurance, telecommunications and media, travel and transport, healthcare and pharmaceuticals, and government. Also joining uh, Richard today to help field your question is Pamela Webster of Eshore. She is the Caribbean Latin American a Regional Relationship Manager for Cybersecurity, SAAS, and Corporate Cyber Education. So before I turn over to Richard, let me remind you that you may submit your questions during the presentation via the chat feature. There will also be the usual question and answer segment at the end of the presentation. We'll be taking your questions during this segment. There is a raised hand feature at the bottom of your screen, which allows you to indicate uh, when you wish to ask a question, at which time we will bring up on the, you up on the screen and unmute your microphone. So I'd like to thank you for joining us. And now I'd like to turn it over, turn it over to Richard. Why, right, thank you, Will. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for taking, uh, taking your time out this Friday um, end of week uh, to join this presentation. I think um, this is timely because uh, we are having conversations about COVID-19, the impact of technology around the world. So is many other businesses um, up and down uh, the Caribbean and, and certainly um, around the world. Can everybody see my screen? The, the, the presentation slide should say video perspective. Yes, we can see it, uh, Richard. Okay, fantastic. So I'll kick off. Um, again, video, uh, as you know, a global firm, we share a lot of insights, um, a lot of uh, uh, data uh, between ourselves. And some of the things that we are seeing uh, around the COVID-19 is, is um, unprecedented as you, you could imagine. We have not seen something like this, certainly in my lifetime. We've had 9-11 um, we've had attacks in, in uh, um, September, 9-11 attacks. We've had uh, SARS. We've had a number of different uh, 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 types of, um, of, epi of epidemics or um, you know, biological uh, breakouts in, in, into, the, into the world, but we've never had something like COVID-19 that has caused the entire world to shut down. Um, shut down in the sense that we uh, cannot do business in the norms that we, you and all of our social activities has uh, dramatically changed. Here in Cayman, we obviously taken the approach to ensure that we keep people safe by um, implementing rules, implementing laws, implementing policies, procedures like working from home, and all of those things help uh, to ensure that the virus um, was kept at a minimum and certainly um, uh, didn't spread as we've seen in, in, other, in other countries. Uh, again, information technology departments are, 
um, and now implementing procedures that have been discussed but really executed. And I think that's a very important point because um, if you were cognizant of the changes that happened around 2018, uh, 2019 in terms of how technology was disrupting industry and how businesses were then sitting around uh, boardroom tables and talking about um, how we're going to reshape our global policies, how we're going to reshape our strategies in order to meet the technology uh, changes which were impacting their business. Um, a lot of companies had these discussions. A lot of companies look at things like business continuity planning. They look at uh, things like disaster recovery. But a number of businesses, certainly from what we've seen and from what our clients was, have been saying to us over the last couple of months, a number of these policies and procedures were not tested. Um, COVID-19 has shaken up. Uh, this industry, uh, particularly the technology industry, and we can talk a little bit about that later. We also see business continuity without an end game, an end time, uh, admit conditions that change daily um, on a scale that businesses have never seen before. With every other type of um, disaster, uh, you know, every other type of uh, impact that we've seen on the business uh, environment. Uh, take, for example, the, the financial impact in 2008, uh, 2009. And again, like I said earlier, um, September 11, all of those uh, impacts had an end game. There were conversations about when we're going to return to business as normal. There were conversations about how we need to shape our models going forward, uh, what our expect, uh, uh, how we need to meet uh, client expectation. With this impact, it is very different. Business continuity is in a flux. It is constantly being having, being needing to adapt to what is being said. So governments are not sure um, about what is going to happen or what they need to at least uh, address over the next 90 days. Um, I heard the, um, the chief executive of the Dubai uh, travel agency said on Sky News yesterday that people should stop saying, um, you know, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, because we, really we, no one knows. Um, no one really knows what to do. So businesses certainly um, uh, here in Cayman are constantly looking at business continuity and looking at the ways they need to adapt their current model or their current processes in order to make themselves relevant to client demands, effective and efficient as far as clients are concerned. Again, supply chains, what we've seen um, um, in, in, in terms of IT products is very opaque, and that's to say the least. The demand on a different kind of IT service, and again, that hangs on the conversations about looking at how artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, uh, tools or uh, uh, disrupting businesses, are at least forcing companies to rethink their strategy, their business strategy. So what we are seeing, um, you know, in terms of vendors and other third parties supporting uh, clients uh, that this is also in, 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 in a flux. We've seen security being challenged in every sense of the word how people keep information safe, how they keep information also only applicable to those who should view it, and how they behave in a certain way that will be consistent with their security policies. Again, we're going to talk a little bit about that later, uh, but we're going to, we have seen a number of attacks, and, and obviously that's going to be, raise a lot of concern uh, to business owners. Again, from our perspective, uh, we have seen uh, uh, how do we address key areas? How do we address key areas or key threats or priority areas? And again, what, we have, what, what you're seeing and certainly what uh, customers are, are saying to us is that they now have so much to do uh, because um, COVID-19 in a lot of ways have caught a number of businesses um, unawares. Uh, again, they were talking about certain things uh, in relationship to technology impacts, but a lot of those things were not implemented. Some companies were doing things manually, and again, the change of culture, again, was not really uh, taken seriously. 
So now what we have is a number of security threats uh, that is out there as a result of the, the rapid change that we've seen in our industry, both here in Cayman and around the world. And again, um, you know, the conversations that we are having uh, with our clients is the ability um, to mobilize our workforce uh, um, in, in, in a remote way. Um, and again, a number of uh, governments have encouraged working from home for obvious reasons to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 and obviously to ensure that people remain safe. But again, working from home has opened up a number of, of, of challenges, not only security wise, but health and safety. Um, I was speaking to one of my colleagues in, in the UK and uh, um, she was saying that um, the companies are now helping to address people working from home in terms of making sure that their broadband connection is secure, making sure that in, in terms of health and safety, they've got the right seating, they've got the right environment um, uh, to, to, to make sure people can be efficient as possible. And uh, a number of companies has levied uh, resources, uh, financial resources in order to make this happen. So this whole mobile workforce, which has now come to the forefront of this, uh, of, of um, us trying to stay connected to our clients is going to be something that is gonna be on the minds of leaders and, and, and certainly in the, in, in the boardroom for quite some time going forward. So uh, in general terms, uh, I would put these into two categories. And one, the first category is one, we are having conversations because of this pandemic around how do we uh, keep uh, information safe? How do we safeguard information whilst connected uh, to our clients, connected to our suppliers, connected uh, to, to our, uh, our staff? Um, and at the same time, how do we ensure the confidentiality of that information? How do we ensure that information uh, is available only to people who should, should see it? And how do we ensure the integrity of that information, i.e. how do we ensure that information that we have access to is correct and not only correct, but it's also uh, um, uh, uh, um, accurate in, 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 in safekeeping uh, once that information is shared to third parties. So that's one lens that we can look at. The second lens that we can look at is certainly from what government is saying in relationship to working from home. We've seen an overwhelming number of organizations implement working uh, from home procedures. And it raised questions around whether um, areas such as working from home, is it here to stay? And a number of businesses uh, are looking at that uh, to ensure that uh, they address their current model and whereby taking advantage of innovative ideas in terms of um, you know, providing uh, a service to their client. We've seen innovation thinking uh, that has come to the forefront. And again, a number of businesses here in Cayman have begun to adopt things such as what we're doing here today, uh, webinars and having conference calls. Um, you know, not only that, we've seen businesses in the retail industry, um, you know, products and goods industry providing services to clients through delivery and pickup uh, services. So we've seen innovation going on at an alarming rate. But whilst we're innovating, a key note to remember here that we need to ensure that we maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of that data. So let me give an example. If uh, stores, supermarkets are delivering uh, goods uh, to, product, to, to customers, it is still the requirement of the supermarket to maintain the safety and confidentiality of uh, customer data. And we'll, we're gonna have uh, conversations and, and, and at least I'll talk about that later. What we've also seen a shift in, um, in general terms in how we collaborate as a business. We've seen businesses now, and, and certainly uh, within BDO, um, we have now taken to the phone, to Zoom, uh, to, to a number of different platforms, both talking internally 
amount to ourselves and then talking uh, remotely to our clients. And I think that's very important. Uh, particularly in a time like this, clients will need to understand what is going on in the marketplace. Um, you know, specialists like ourselves able to share our thoughts in terms of how clients could navigate the current landscape. And again, another area that we've seen is opportunity for businesses to bolster uh, client relationships. So whereby, we, uh, you know, in the past we could have had um, um, you know, the odd email uh, to the client probably once a week. I might pick up the phone uh, once every other week. Now we have uh, an opportunity to, um, you know, corroborate and collaborate with our clients to understand how we could better help them, support them, provide an effective service, an efficient service, and also to add value. So this is an opportunity to build client relationships. Another thing, and generally we could demonstrate great efficiency and effectiveness and adding value, which, which, which is what I've, I've, I've just mentioned. So what does this look like? You might ask, what does this pandemic look like? We're talking about technology. So let's have a look in terms of what is, what was really happening on the ground. You know, I said earlier that over the last two years, uh, we've seen technologies, uh, technology advances push the very boundary um, of, of, um, of the business environment. Um, we've seen businesses forcing to implement IT strategies and different models. And a number of businesses have done that, whether they moved from having an in-house um, you know, uh, services to cloud services, or whether they've adapted some form of um, machine learning or, or artificial intelligence uh, uh, um, type programs to help manage processes. But at the same time, what we've seen certainly with the impact of this um, COVID-19, and I've just took in, taken some stats from the IT Governance UK website. Uh, for the month of April, um, over 216 million records breached, uh, which is an increase of around 200% compared to the same time last year. If you were, um, if you've, um, you know, kept in touch in terms of what's going on online, you would see that uh, a law firm was hacked, uh, Grumsmanshire was hacked, and they've lost something like 756 gigabytes of data. Um, the uh, uh, Grumsman, uh, Shire law firm, is, they deal with a lot of celebrities or so in the entertainment industry, and the, uh, the hackers are demanding payment, uh, else they're going to expose a lot of their uh, information, so 756 gigabytes probably dwarfs what you've got, what I have on the screen, 216 million records. And just to give you a flavor uh, of what that looks like, um, on the screen uh, you, you can see a number of industries that had reported uh, that they have been hacked, and I guess because of data privacy requirements, they have to report, although a number of them you would see unknown because they have not yet at the time this particular stat was created, quantify how many records were breached as a result. And bearing in mind that if you live in Cayman and you have a record breach, that you would also not only identify the impact uh, to your business, but you would have to identify the impact to data subjects because of our current law. To my understanding, the data privacy law hasn't changed. So if you are hacked um, in any way, uh, you would have to assess the impact uh, to your data subjects. And obviously that assessment needs to be taken into consideration uh, that you're going to report. If that impact was um, significant, you're gonna have to report it to the ombudsman. But in terms of the figures, we've seen cyber attacks on Pakistani mobiles, again, uh, 115 million records exposed. Zoom accounts uh, were sold on the dark web, 500,000. And again, as you know, from, um, from different media outlets, Zoom is also in trouble uh, for sharing data on Facebook. Uh, so they're currently being sued. 
uh, in the US. And as you can see, uh, the, these type of attacks is hitting everyone, ransomware. Um, and again, the company I mentioned earlier, uh, Grumsman Shire, they were hit with ransomware. As a result, they lost uh, you know, sev over 700 um, gigabytes of data. Uh, Brandywine, urology consultants, they've lost uh, 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 300 and uh, sorry, 131,825 uh, gigabytes of data. And again, you have a number of unknowns there. And this is just in the month of April. This is during the pandemic. So if anyone is under the illusion uh, that, you know, uh, cyber security, cyber threat is not real, uh, this is what's happening. And this is what I captured, um, you know, almost three months, uh, three weeks ago. So th this data is, 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 is somewhat uh, out of date. IT company leaked personal information, 337,384 uh, records lost. A marketing company had a leak, um, which is a data breach of 95 million uh, records. Uh, the Indian government citizens data 900 uh, and, and the list continues. Financial information, uh, the Korean U.S. bank had 397,665 uh, 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 records uh, leaked, um, you know, chartered institute securities and investment uh, leave uh, members vulnerable to fraud. Again, they haven't mentioned um, at, at the time of this report, how many members were exposed, but, but the figures are there. The, um, in addition to that, uh, malicious incidents, um, the UK government met on Zoom, and I'm, I just mentioned this because Zoom again, we are meeting on Zoom today, uh, uh, um, and accidents posted, and accidentally posted the, uh, the meeting ID. Um, which means because of the U.S. Gov it is the U.K. government, there's a significant risk there, uh, depending on who and what information is being shared. And obviously, this meeting ID means that there was there would be a, there was a breach. Again, the the, the number of unknown uh, uh, who this has impacted in government was unknown at the time of this uh, of of this report. But this gives us a flavor of what has happened in April uh, compared to what has happened last year in 2019. Cyber criminals are looking for weaknesses. They are looking for opportunities where companies might have not been uh, 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 proactive in, in putting in place procedures. They're looking at those vulnerabilities. Cayman is an offshore jurisdiction uh, providing financial services uh, to businesses all around the world, um, often made of made uh, uh, um, there are jokes made of you know Cayman is an offshore no tax jurisdiction in movies and so on. So Cayman is on the map uh, as a as an attractive um, you know uh, uh, honeycomb for cyber threat uh, cyber criminals, and during this uh, pandemic, they are out in force and they're there to do um, harm. Uh, but I believe, uh, you know, listening to the uh, webinars that have gone on during uh, this time that a number of businesses were proactive here in Cayman and putting, putting in place uh, security procedures. So what would I consider, uh, what we have considered as some key focus areas? Well. Um, cultural awareness, we consider this as key, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Network security, endpoint security, vulnerability management, and security incident management. I think, um, you know, just, just looking at this list, and I believe these are the key areas that we should be looking at as a business from an IT perspective. I think from this list, cultural awareness is fundamental how we do things, this behavior, this um, idea of, uh, of, of um, we do things in a certain way. Um, you know, in the past, this is how we do it. Today, this is how we do it. 
Um, we don't really need to uh, do certain things. Uh, uh, you know, we don't really need to implement that control. That control is erroneous. This cultural behavior and this awareness is fundamental. The number of technologies which have security controls already embedded as part of their design. The number of vendors like myself uh, talk about security controls, talk about tools and resources in order to keep things safe. But quite often when there's a security breach, it's a human error. It's otherwise an inside threat, which could be deliberate in some cases, or it could be uh, uh, because of ignorance. And ignorance does not mean stupidity. Ignorance means that people are not simply aware of what they're supposed to do. So this webinar today hopefully shine, shines some light on the sort of things that we should be doing if we are looking at technology and looking at whether or not we have appropriate controls or the right level of controls and the right level of awareness programs in place to make sure that users know what they're supposed to do, particularly now that we're working from home. And uh, now that we're working outside of a control environment, a mobile environment. Cultural awareness sh um, shines a lot of light on things such as these mobile phones, how we use these devices in order to stay connected, not only to our local offices, but how we stay connected to our clients. And if I were to do a poll and a survey and ask how many businesses today make sure that their employees are running secure programs like VPNs on their mobile phone during this epidemic, during this pandemic, how many companies are ensuring that if they don't have um, security on bring your own device tools, that that particular tool should not receive business emails. I would probably see that a number of businesses have not yet considered it or were in the process, but have not implemented the right level of security. And again, my view in terms of cultural awareness is really a top-down approach in a business. Management should be taking the responsibility to create the right culture in the business, the right top-down approach to ensure that employees are doing things in the right way, not only when they come into the office, but when they go out into the general public, when they work from home. It is my view that is not, uh, um, um, it is not only enough to, to write a policy and says, this is our policy sign here. Clients, customers should be, um, should be made aware of what their responsibilities are and how they need to conduct themselves when they're outside of the, uh, when they're outside of the office. Another significant area, and we've talked about it, but my experience certainly within the technology sphere have given me great insight in terms of network security. Network security largely is about how do we ensure that users who have access to customer data, that that access is appropriate, that that access is restricted. I have been doing auditing, as Will have said in the beginning of my presentation, I've been in the audit industry and the advisory industry for more than 20 years. I have audited technology controls in depth. I have seen many companies, more than 80% of companies, when I've looked at who has access to what in the organization, I've reported to CIOs, COOs, CEOs, and the board that we have significant risks because we've got powerful accounts who have, we got users who have access to powerful accounts. Take for example, a company who have an application, a financial application running a sysadmin account. Now a sysadmin account is a very powerful account. Some applications require this account in order to perform certain requirements. But who has access to this? IT people generally have access to sysadmin accounts. That's over and above database administrative accounts, DBAs, or what you call administrative accounts 
i.e. powerful accounts that allow users to be set up on the system. A sysadmin account can destroy a table structure. It can destroy the application. It can delete audit trails. But quite often, I've seen users have access to this account, mainly IT people, and the business is not aware. More importantly, they don't know how to control powerful accounts. So when an auditor like myself come in and say, you have powerful accounts which is accessible to people who should not have access, or these, access account, these, these accounts um, are not managed, and by managed, I mean they're not uh, monitored and business are not recording or reporting or uh, you know, uh, uh, providing some form of audit in terms of what these accounts are being used for. And this is IT people, whether the IT person is in-house or whether the IT person is out, outside, you know, you know um, a third party, whether that third party is here in Cayman or whether that third party is somewhere else uh, in the rest of the world. And oftentimes companies are breached because they don't have control over who have access uh, to these powerful accounts. What I've also seen in the sphere of network security is accounts which are sitting on customer systems are deemed inactive, but users within that business have access to these accounts. I believe that a number of security breaches is because management don't have controls over network security. Yes, they say they've got IT people and IT people have shut down certain accounts or make certain accounts disabled. But from an auditor's perspective, and certainly from my experience, I have seen network security cause probably is the highest cause of audit failures uh, that I have seen from an IT point of view. Another point is run end user security. End user security is a little bit more managed because obviously these are tools that run in the background. Oftentimes they're automated but what customers need to be aware that if you're running these tools, and when I say customers, I mean management, everything that I'm sharing here today is not towards IT. It's not for IT directors or managers. This is for business users or business management. People in business take accountability to use IT to enable them to do things, or, you know, meet their objectives. So when we talk about network security, this is a business requirement. Business takes the ownership to make sure or to ensure that their systems are designed to keep information safe, to keep information uh, you know, only accessible to the right level of people within their business. So running the right antivirus software, how do I know as a business that my software patching uh, antivirus patching or updates are current. How do I know that patching is current? If you're using bring your own device, how do I know that that particular device meets my security requirements? Again, management in business, business management should take priority and ensure that these are monitored. Vulnerability management is also another area that is significant, making sure that businesses understand what vulnerabilities they face. I know a number of businesses haven't done any vulnerability assessment. They might have done some form of pen test or penetration test assessment years ago, but they haven't yet done a revamp of what their exposures are like. They haven't yet considered what their vulnerabilities were before the pandemic. The pandemic happened, they sent a number of people to work from home, but they don't know, I'm talking about management, don't know what their vulnerabilities look like because they haven't done a vulnerability assessment, a test to see whether their systems are operating as designed, not only operating as designed, whether those designs are effective. In other words, they are appropriate based on the threat levels that is in the marketplace and whether those particular designs were operating before the pandemic and certainly operating during the pandemic. A lot of businesses probably have this area as a great, a great scale. 
in addition to this security incident management is where businesses have processes or policies in place to manage how they deal with a security incident if and when it arises. If you participated in any form of data privacy uh, compliance or protection, security incident would have been one of those topics that uh, would have been on your radar. Why? Because if you are in breach of the data protection law here in Cayman, you have five days to report to the ombudsman um, of a security breach. That means you would have to determine what the breach was. That means you would have had to assess that breach uh, to, the, to, to determine the impact on personally identifiable information. You'd have had to determine how to mitigate that breach, how to report that breach, whether that would be to management or the data subject where applicable, and then uh, the ombudsman, and, and then how you monitor that breach going forward. A security incident management process puts in place the safeguards about how you behave in the event there, that there is a breach, or in the event that there's a security concern. Whether you're losing information, whether somebody says they've received a phishing email, what do that person do in the event? And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, those, what we call key risk points or key triggers later, but security incident management is fundamental in being able that the, in being able for business to meet those security requirements in terms of making sure that the breach does not spread throughout the entire organization, quantifying it, and obviously uh, where necessary, terminate, um, um, you know, mitigating uh, those particular risks. So these are just some of the key areas. I'm not saying this is a conclusive list, but some of the areas that you would need, uh, you should have considered are considering uh, during, this, uh, during this pandemic. So, like I said, the cultural awareness in my view is probably one of the biggest challenges. I come from the UK, so um, when I came into the Caribbean, uh, when I came here into Cayman, I noticed the culture of, of course is very different. Um, they're different in a lot of ways, for example, I remember when I pulled up to a petrol station um, and I, the guy pumped gas. We don't have that in the UK, so that's great. Thumbs up. Uh, not getting um, petrol on your, on your hands. But the guy took my credit card and walked away with it, uh, you know, to, to, to make payment. Uh, or when you go into a supermarket, they take your credit card. This was very unusual, certainly for me. Um, because, you know, of course, in the UK, no one touches your credit card but you. Um, you know, years ago, you would give people your credit card, but you certainly don't um, give people your credit card, um, uh, uh, you know, wherever you go in, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so the culture here, I was told, don't worry about it, you know, it's fine, it's safe. Well, that same culture is very uh, quite, to me, is quite um, uh, 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 prevalent in a lot of things that has been done whether that is um, you know, in business, and as we talked about uh, IT here today, in the IT, um, in the IT uh, department, or whether that is just in our social way that we uh, behave in general. Um, but imagine this for one moment, you can work from home, but the business has not really talked about you know, what working from home should be like. Um, you know, what, what, what should be the, the uh, uh, things that you would expect to uh, see and certainly address when working from home. Do my kids have access to my laptop when I'm working from home? What about my partner? Do I talk to my partner about issues that happen at work, about challenges of getting onto my network and about certainly, certainly in some cases, uh, you know, in, uh, business information, the answer is no. I believe businesses would have said you don't uh, you don't talk about business information and you ensure that it is segregated. But what if I'm working in the sitting room or the living room where it's a communal area for everyone? How do I have a conference call with a client having members of my family in the same house? 
how do I detect things such as phishing emails? You know, what's a phishing email? I've seen a number of them uh, during this pandemic. And all I did was send it to IT and I said, I don't know what this is. Um, and IT needs, uh, and I asked them, could you investigate? But, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about phishing emails because there's a number of COVID-19 websites which are bad websites. They are not the legit website. And I've certainly, people have gone onto these websites and start clicking uh, to get information about the, 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 um, about the impact. And again, the whole social uh, engineering piece. In my view, uh, culture, uh, culture and awareness is probably one of, gonna be one of our biggest challenges. And I hope that people join the conversation later and give their point of view of how they have dealt with this cultural awareness during the pandemic. Um, so ideas around how do we ensure cultural awareness is reinforced? Well, we need to educate people. We need to continuously uh, educate end users to ensure that they're up to date with the best security practices uh, for not only new technology, but also uh, if we're gonna ask them to work from home. We need to keep end users aware of the current threats. So this is ongoing conversations with our customers and certainly our clients about the current threats uh, that are in the marketplace and how these threats could impact our business. If we are having these conversations internally and not with our supply chains, then we run a risk of our supply chains opening up a gateway and exposing us to risks that otherwise could be avoided. So not only do we have these conversations with our, cust with our, with our, our, our employees, but it's necessary for ha to have these conversations with uh, our third party providers, our supply chains, our vendors, and anyone who is connected to our business. Having training, ongoing training, you know, simulate uh, different types of attacks. And this is not an exercise where you can just tick a box to say, yes, we've done it, and you go on. Remember I said earlier, this is a, um, top-down approach, management should be taking ownership of this and setting the tone within the organization. Because what I have seen in 20 years of doing this business, that oftentimes it comes down to a tick box exercise. Have you done the training? Tick. Have you read the policy? Tick. Have you signed the policy? Tick. But when I audit people, I talk to people, I interview people about the policies and about, you know, you know, how do you behave? Are you behaving in a certain way when it comes to keeping information safe? There I would report that a number of customers and certainly in my experience over 20 years have treated this like a tick box exercise. And that's where, you know, it becomes difficult. In addition to that, I mentioned earlier incident reporting. I'm not gonna label on this because I think I gave you some good insight uh, to what I mean by uh, uh, incident management. And certainly for a number of you who have had me speak about you know, the data protection law, I've talked about this in some detail about how you need or how businesses should put in place the measures in order to respond to incidents. Now, I see this and I just put this here, so at least you're aware of it. I see a number of companies saying, yes, we've got an incident management system in place. So, you know, we've got a system that governs how we report incidents. So we are good, we've, this is automated and so on. But remember, you know, most of the time people get hacked. They get hacked because people are not doing their job properly. Uh, because people are not aware of, uh, you know, the security risks and incidences. And more importantly, when there is a risk, how do people behave? How do people respond? How are we responding to the COVID-19? Do we still go out and don't care about, uh, you know, whether or not uh, uh, we spread the disease? Do we still go out and have, you know, meet our family and friends and not do social distancing? And then if we do do that, if there is an incident, how do we then respond to it? Um, do we not go to the authorities and keep it inside? 
uh, and so on. I mean, there's a number of things that we should be doing and there's a number of things that we should be made aware to do, but at least it comes down to whether or not you're aware of what you need to do in the event that there is an incident. And this particular lens in terms of uh, incident management takes the view that you understand that the plans which are in place and how you need to respond, the list of type of incidents and what we will cover, consider as a security incident and how you would need to respond. Um, you know, the attack vendor uh, ve uh, vectors and the risks that you need to prioritize when you do, a, um, when you do an assessment based on the uh, risk that you've now been exposed to. If you are trying to determine whether or not a phishing email has been spread to a number of employees within the organization, how do you do that? Do you send an email broadcast? Will that exacerbate the issue now that someone has got malware in their system and now you're broadcasting every employee? Or do you use some other form of intranet to make people aware or phone to send people texts to say that there have been an outbreak and reduce the risk and spreading the email further, not only internally, but also to your clients? And again, we really need to understand how to behave and obviously not only understanding the policies and procedures, but how do we behave in the event that there is a risk. In addition to that, obviously making sure that uh, we have plans and, you know, with appropriate stakeholders, people within the business who are held accountable in terms of how they need to behave when there's an incident and obviously uh, making sure that vendors, and if you follow data protection law, you know as a controller, you need to ensure that the data processor is doing things in a certain way. Not only signing the contract to say that, yes, I will carry out your requirements, but also you being the controller, making sure that the sub-processor or the processor is doing things in a certain, certain way. So reviewing plans with appropriate stakeholders doesn't mean only internally, but externally. So in addition to the threats, um, the key areas that I mentioned earlier, these are some of the key threats, I think are something that you and I need to pay attention to and need to be aware of. Phishing emails, I think we've gone through that. I think we know what a phishing email is. It looks like it comes from a legitimate source, in some cases, it doesn't look like it, but it could come from a legitimate source. And uh, you click on it could, you know, lead you to otherwise compromise your machine and as a result spread throughout the organization. Um, and we've seen, and certainly I've seen a number of phishing emails during, uh, uh, during, this, during, during this pandemic. How do you identify a phishing email? Well, again, that will come through a number of training courses, uh, a number of simulations that you've done within your business and you need to make sure that you're doing simulations during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic just to see whether customers are aware of what they're doing. And these are non-harmless simulations. Uh, you just want to see whether people have read the procedures, read the, the document, and whether they understand it. If you haven't done so, I encourage you to do so. Malicious applications, and I've seen um, a number of COVID-19 maps uh, people have clicked on these maps and it has taken them to dark web websites where their information has been compromised. And again, sometimes the customer, the, the, the person who have compromised the system is not aware that they've been compromised. And as a result, it is spread throughout the networks. Again, that figure 219,000 million records being exposed, a number of those exposures were through people clicking COVID-19 map websites. And these are not legitimate websites at all. The best way would be to go to a legitimate website. Uh, I go to obviously bbc.co.uk and then I have links within there that help navigate me to the, 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 the right website. Instead of typing into your Google search, COVID website map and hundreds of maps come up and the first thing that you do, you click on the first website. Again, very dangerous but that comes to learning, it comes to educating your users. Endpoint security, 
Again, we talked about this, making sure that people are running um, the latest antivirus. These should be, um, you know, this user should be disabled, that they cannot interrupt the running of these uh, particular tools. And I believe a number of um, organizations have already done so. Limiting what people can put in their USB uh, drive is also very important to ensure that people can't use a USB stick and as a result, if they're working from home, uh, introduce um, you know different applications or different um, documents or different uh, um, uh, 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 work into the working environment uh, that shouldn't be there. And I think this is very important. Uh, bad domains and fake websites, I think that shares to the knowledge of what you would expect in terms of uh, COVID-19 maps and you want to avoid going to websites which will compromise your systems. Again, a number of businesses have processes in place that are running in the background that would disable uh, users from accessing and going to, uh, um, going to these websites. Um, I believe uh, Pamela is going to come on uh, later and probably uh, share her thoughts around the services and, and, and solutions that they provide in order to mitigate a number of these risks. Ransomware, um, defense in depth mechanisms implemented in your office networks uh, may not protect you, your remote endpoints or end users um, uh, decentralizing data from remote work invalidates your backup uh, strategy. And that's uh, very important. Um, a number of uh, uh, sites a number of uh, users have the opportunity to download a document uh, as uh, instead of working with the document on site. And by on site, for example, if you're working on a document and you're working in SharePoint, SharePoint allows you, uh, gives you the ability, and a number of applications do this, they give you ability to work uh, um, on site and not download the document to your machine. In a number of cases, you don't really need to download your, your document to your machine. Um, because if you have information stored on your machine, and that machine and that particular backup strategy is not designed to backup information stored just on your desktop, you know, it could invalidate your backup strategy. Um, and there are things such as that you will probably want to take in consideration. Um, I certainly use an application. Most of my data is online. Um, it, it is, um, you know, managed and, and, and secured by a company, uh, uh, a number of companies that I believe have the right level of security in place. And again, I'm not saying that any company cannot be breached, but um, I rather do, uh, I rather bank with a bank where I know they have the right level of security and therefore minimizes the risk of my financial information being breached as opposed to um, working with a, a, an individual who might have the skill sets but don't have the infrastructure or don't have the, um, the resources in order to respond if there is a, if there is a, 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 um, a breach. Uh, again, a number of businesses here have been overwhelmed by the number of call outs whether people can't connect back to the office, where they're having issues connecting, whether their data they're trying to access, they're not having uh, um, you know, uh, the right level of access. And again, a number of businesses are struggling to keep up with the, with the, um, with the, with the amount of um, uh, calls that they're having uh, um, in a day. So businesses must be uh, cognizant of not only the threats out there, but the ability to uh, respond if there is a threat and if their business is exposed. Um, just one more, one more slide that I'm going to come off and allow you to talk. Uh, talk about business continuity uh, throughout this presentation. One of the things that I want to bring your attention to is the, the need to look at what is considered essential to your business. This is the core to your business. This means that your business needs to have this in place in order for it to function. And you need to be, make sure that you've identified, um, you know, what priorities um, that you should have in place, what critical um, uh, services that you need uh, to be maintained. And therefore all the actors or all the players need to be, uh, need to be aware of that strategy uh, and the critical suppliers and contractors 
uh, obviously need to you need to have that built in into into your plan. So that's on the central part. At the extended um, uh, um, suspensions, um, what you need to make sure here is that where you need to extend your business continuity in order to meet certain requirements, in order to meet certain demands that need to be factored in as part of your solution. So if it's an online solution and you need to provide uh, service uh, to a supply chain uh, um, uh, domain uh, for whatever reason, or you need to uh, conference someone in on a Zoom call, how you're doing that needs to be absolutely uh, factored in as part of your procedures. Uh, you need to have a list of uh, designates who can fill out, um, uh, who, who can fill in for critical employees. That will be part of your extension. You need to determine how your businesses will run uh, with a reduced workforce. That, and most more importantly, a deal, reduced workforce, but still dealing with your priorities, still dealing with your critical services, and still dealing with the critical supplies and contractors. That is fundamental. Uh, you need to ensure and determine how your business will run if customers or suppliers can't uh, come to your place of business. And again, a number of businesses are looking to put in place procedures when people can, so can people can return uh, back to work. And this is not just saying, oh, let's return back to work and continue business as normal. Uh, not so at all. Uh, businesses need to make sure that they implement social distancing uh, procedures at work. Um, you know, people need to ensure that their, you know, place of work is sanitized uh, to, um, to minimize any spread of any germ in this case. Uh, need to ensure if you have cleaners coming to the office uh, or, or people coming uh, third parties to deliver services, that there are processes in place to minimize the, the risk of, um, you know, breach of social distancing as well as spreading the virus, so people wearing face masks and so on. So there's a number of things uh, that needs to be considered as opposed to just saying people can return back to the work and then showing, uh, you know, the police are showing uh, authorities that you have a paper from government saying I can return back to work. Not, not the case. You need to ensure that you have this extension to what you call the, ex the essential services to cater for all the things that need to be in place as a result of, of this pandemic. And like I said in the previous slide, we are not sure uh, how long this pandemic will, will continue. We don't know what's the end game and therefore the extension um, of, uh, of, of, these, uh, of, of these services need to be in place. Um, temporary suspensions, obviously that's something that you need to consider uh, a function that may be suspended for a short period of time in order to minimize any potential risk uh, to your business and into your employees and your, and, your, and your contractors. Again, that is something that you would need to ensure uh, that uh, you have built into your overall plan. Uh, those are just some of the high level touch points and some of the conversations that certainly we've had internally as a firm globally uh, that we've had with our customers and we've had uh, with our suppliers. Um, um, just as a, a closing remark, again, that cultural awareness, I want to reinforce that if you're talking about people working from home, regardless of previous state of your security, cultural awareness program, uh, this is the time to retain all your employees uh, as they adjust to the remote working. Endpoint security, again, making sure you have a mix of managed and unmanaged and bring your device endpoint security uh, in place to keep remote, remote workers connected and productive. And again, the security incident in terms of making sure that if you do have a security incident, you know how to respond, you know what to do in the event you have a breach. And that needs to be communicated in my view. Uh, these points need to be communicated in my view uh, from, uh, from top management. It needs, they need to set tone in the organization going forward, change the culture in terms of what we do and how we're doing uh, things going forward in light of this um, global uh, pandemic. And more importantly, going forward as businesses seek 
to become more efficient and effective and add value uh, to their, add a, a, what I call a better value to their customers. Thank you all for listening. And I guess it's open up to questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Richard. A very comprehensive presentation. Um, I, I guess, you know, we are moving. I'm going to ask everyone if you want to put your questions in the chat, that would be really good. Or if you want to push, um, raise your hand and then I can um, you kind of un unmute your mic. Um, I also wanted to kind of, I know Pam is also on this, on this uh, presentation as well. So I thought maybe there she is. I'm going to unmute her mic so she can kind of uh, give us her perspectives as well. She's on the panel. Fantastic. Hi, Pam. There you are. Good morning. Hi. Hi. How is everyone today? Great. Um, I just put uh, a couple of notes in the uh, side chat. But first, I want to thank Richard, who's got this bang on. What a, a professional, a great background. You know, BDO is doing fantastic things with not just financial audits, but he is regionally the security audit and IT audit. He's got a full team. And I think with uh, that's a great place to start with uh, incident management, uh, working backwards from his last slide, is to really understand what's going to happen and the severity, where are your gaps? You know, where, where can you do for a small business, like a lot of our chamber companies, to large regional businesses? And I think the challenge is everybody as a large bank can have fantastic security and 20 IT staff. Well, what do you do when you're a small business and you're challenged by, uh, you don't have an IT manager, you don't have a risk plan, you don't have a continuity plan, except for, you know, what do you do in case of a hurricane, right? But as we know, 90% of incidents have nothing to do with weather. Uh, you know, although we've got hurricane season coming up June 1st, a lot of this comes down to Richard's key point. This is fundamentally, and he said it three times, thank you, Richard. Fundamentally, okay, this is a management top down. And I can't tell you how many times I tell people, this is not IT's job. IT will deploy what the CEO, the human resources and compliance team say they should after examining it. But please don't be afraid of technology and just say, well, I've got somebody named Joe who does that. Because when it comes to cybersecurity, Joe probably doesn't know Jack. And there's a lot out there to sift through. We're always happy. Uh, and thank you, Chamber of Commerce Business of the Year, uh, Eshor. Uh, with women in IT, we're also nominated now for the Latin American Council for Women in IT. And our focus is purely cybersecurity. And, uh, you know, but to go back to what Richard was saying is, one of the easiest things to do is cultural awareness. I had sent out um, some of my tips and tricks. Please feel free to share that to anybody. It's, it goes down to everything from what you look for in a fish, how do you see if you know that address is true? Well, what do you do when you think you have something suspicious? My advice to someone who doesn't have an IT manager is pick up the phone, all right? We've got a lot of third-party vendor hacking. Someone's gonna say, here's your invoice from the cleaning company. Here's your invoice from a bottled water company. Here, you know, they're gonna pretend to be the small and medium-sized business. Uh, you know, uh, let's use some Cayman examples. Here's your invoice from Jake Scott, or you know your receipt from Foster's, uh, or Hurley's, or you know Kirk's. All these places that are doing remote delivery. It would be very easy for a hacker to pretend to be one of our restaurants, right? So if you're not sure and it looks suspicious, there's three checks. One, was it expected? Probably not. Is it asking you to do something like click on something, make a payment, a board? Is it um, worrisome? Does it say something like new payroll? Oh my gosh, everyone's worried about their paycheck during this time. So everyone's gonna click on that email that says new payroll. What do you mean new payroll? What, what? Or pensions, you know, all these things that are up in our newspaper, a hacker can pick up on. And the third thing is, if in doubt, uh, phone a friend, literally. Phone the establishment that's a restaurant, phone the, water company, phone, whoever you might see, 
Um, and those are three easy tips. So I did send my tips and tricks on that efficient. When it comes to the sidebar cultural awareness, um, we offer something called a Tata, which is fun, engaging. It's little videos. It takes less than five minutes a month. Um, and it teaches people everything from not just phishing, but um, passwords. What's a good password management? Um, then what about you know uh, selfies, people taking selfies and posting it and really damaging your cultural business reputation? So that goes beyond just your IT phishing. Um, I think it kind of leads into your workers from home. Uh, uh, and I hope I'm not going too fast, but working from home, you really need to have fundamental awareness, employee training right now that will improve morale. You need it to be fun, engaging, make them feel like they are protecting your own business. So that's really important, not shaming. You clicked on something, here's a naughty tool. You need something that's engaging. Uh, speaking about email, we offer something right now, we see the risk that Richard showed a lot of these ransomware breaches start with a email and it's usually mistaken. Um, I'm happy to share a video uh, at the end of this. I'll try to look it up and people want to leave the chat on I'll, or I'll send it to the chamber and they can forward it. A lot of inside risk right now is employees working from home. They get an email from their Hotmail uh, address, a resume or uh, an article and they go to share it with the business colleagues. Unfortunately, if you're bringing in something from Hotmail or Gmail, and you think you're doing the right thing by now sending it to your boss on your work email, unfortunately, you've just sent a weaponized attachment or a weaponized link or a ransomware or a fish. So having people sending things from their home devices to their business device is the biggest risk of 2020. And that's called, uh, you know, remote actors need to use internal email protect. Right now, everyone has these wonderful firewalls that outside the perimeter, you know, you've got the phishing held, you've got the attachments, you've got scanning, but no one's really looking at the east to west traffic. And that means the emails that are coming from one employee to another employee. Those are the biggest risk we're seeing for remote workers. Um, some easy tips you can do for remote workers is enforce two-factor authentication. That's where if you get something, you have to now check it on your phone. Is this correct? And you put in a little code, just like when you do your banking, they send you a verification code. Very important. A lot of two-factor authentications are free. Um, if you wanna to go to a business model, again, they can be really inexpensive licenses. Most licenses we sell um, across the board are about $50 an employee per year. So we try to make things very, very, very cheap. For small businesses, uh, you know, big businesses are great as well, but we do focus our consulting on a lot of small business. And uh, again, we really need to get human resources involved, CEOs and the compliance team. So, you know, those are my little tips right there. I'll try to uh, look up the uh, insider email protect, but those are some things that we offer. Uh, again, cultural awareness. I couldn't agree with Richard Moore. We've got Thank you. Thank you, Pam. That's, that's really awesome. And both of you, great, great interventions. And congratulations, Pam, on your business of the year through the chamber. We, we're proud of you and all the hard work you and your team have done, <laughs> particularly your upcoming award. Hopefully that'll be something you're, you're successful with as well. The, I mean, obviously the chamber itself as, as an organization that has more than 600 or 700 businesses as involved with it, we, we've taken various steps to ensure security as well, IT, but the, the challenge we have as a small business, again, is that, you know, these things, as you said, Pam, you know, not every small business can really afford some of these tools. Um, but obviously, I think it's something that, do you both agree that it's something that you should just automatically factor in your regular budget for your company these days? It's no longer a thing which you can't, you you you're going to be remain, you're going to be vulnerable if you don't do something about it. They are going after smaller companies because the, the bad guys, um, they know that the large banks and larger, any company that's over a hundred employees, uh, first of all, any company that's over a hundred employees should not be using Zoom. So, um, you know, ask us about it. There's some other more secure ones. I think Richard agrees on that one too. Um, 
I think we, we're using Anytime Business. Um, Teams is good. There's, there's a couple of other ones out there, but I think this one's less expensive than Zoom. So there you go. But I think there's a lot of things that small businesses can do. And one of them is uh, getting somebody in the organization. Maybe it's the owner of the organization. Maybe it's, um, you know, second in charge. They can, you know, work with us for some just free uh, tools. And then also, you know, just again, you want to keep it so that the employees feel empowered during this process. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Richard's, uh, again, on that last slide, the last slide, the security incident management and the vulnerability management, even any small business should take the time to get an assessment. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't know your gaps and they might be huge and wide, but until you get a professional to look at those gaps, um, you might just be layering software on and, you know, layer software on to lock the front door, but the bedroom window has been open. Richard, what do you think? Yeah, yeah I, 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 it's, it's, it's an interesting conversation because um, I remember having, um, you know, a lot of meetings with my clients here. And I said to them, well, under the current law, the data protection law, if you are breached, you'll be charged more by the ombudsman than I'm charging you to do this exercise. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I gave them the figures. I said, I'm not trying to scare you. I know that you're a small business, but you're managing information of customers. If you told the, the customer that you don't meet the minimum requirements, they would probably think twice about buying services from you uh, because they feel that their information in some way would be compromised if they share the information with you. So small businesses um, have to be very careful and think very proactively. I know it's going to cost, but to co the, the cost of not being compliant from a data protection point of view, of course, far outweighs what it will cost you to do a vulnerability assessment exercise or to call me in or call Pam in to do some form of um, your security awareness training. The, 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 the notion that you are a small business today in this environment almost is customers don't really care. I want you to deliver a service and I want that service to meet my requirements. How you deliver that service is important because I want to be sure that if I give you my information or you have access to my information, that, that information is confidential, that information is uh, uh, available only to people who should see it, and that information is correct and complete. So smart, they, I don't, although we talk about smart businesses, I see the challenge to the business environment the same. COVID-19 has impacted everybody the same. Um, small banks, big banks, um, corner shops, um, you know, large, um, you know, coffee outlets, etc. So our response should be in the question on our minds and the discussions we should have in our, um, in our um, uh, uh, boardrooms is we are a business. How do we demonstrate as a business, a one man band or a, you know, 100 customers, 100 employees or more. How do we demonstrate our business that we're professional, we're meeting any regulatory requirements as necessary, and we're demonstrating that we have the le right level of security because we're doing business. And I think that's the key point. Thanks, Richard. There's a question in the chat, which is uh, to you, Richard. In cases where businesses have invoked their business continuity plans, and as a result, everyone is now working from home, have you seen those businesses developing new business continuity plans to address the new normal? Absolutely. Um, what we have seen and the conversations that we are having with our clients, not only here, but uh, um, around the world, is that a number of um, our clients are now readdressing their continuity plans. And they're having to do so because they are now looking at priorities under COVID-19 that they've not had to look at before. So all of a sudden, everybody has gone home and working from home. 
what are the other concerns that we need to, to, to talk about? You know, people have, they live with other people. You know, working from home is great one day a week or maybe in the morning, but for a one month. So what we are seeing in terms of uh, companies and what we are hearing our clients say uh, that they have to make adjustments to their continuity plans to facilitate these new priorities, to address these new critical services. Now that we have tools and services to do monitoring, now that we have third parties who are now engaged in helping us to keep information sure, uh, secure, how do we then facilitate our current plan to deal with all these other extensions? So yes, we have seen uh, uh, an uplift in what currently current uh, customers are using and what they now need to do to extend that use for all the eventualities that has arisen because of COVID-19. Well, one of the things that I'd love to see both of you do is maybe you can send some information to me that I can share with the chamber membership mm -hmm. about you know what services you actually provide so that more of these, a lot of people like you, I think you're, both your presentations and interventions suggest that sometimes IT is, is so essential, but people don't look at it as the top of the line uh, item for their businesses. It's almost like it's infrastructure rather than really, really thinking about it as a potential threat. And, and so until, until be, they become, you know, some fishing expedition or something happens to their business, they don't really take it too, as seriously as they should. And maybe because, for example, we made the decision to choose a Zoom, Zoom as our platform to start doing these webinars. Now, did I evaluate the threat? Well, sort of, but I would have thought Zoom would have done that. And, you know, in order to, you know, now I see that they're putting out something about encryption. So they've actually asked us to download another another version of the program, which mm -hmm. is more secure and encrypted. So I guess that's a perfect example of me saying, you know, I want to help our members be as, you know, with these webinars, but I certainly didn't want to expose them to any risk. Um, but I really, and I didn't have the time to assess these tools as much as I should. So again, I'm, I'm trying not to say I'm trying to expose, I'm not trying to expose anybody anything, but the end of the day, I want to ensure that I'm doing the right thing. So what do your businesses do to help somebody even like me? Um, you know, what services do you provide? Look, well, we, sometimes, sometimes, go ahead, son. sometimes it's housekeeping. You know, I, when people in the, around the world started using Zoom, we didn't know about the threat either. Okay, we, we've used Zoom as well. So no one knew, but it just was, what a soft target. Everybody in the world starts using it. So we just started doing some housekeeping. Like uh, I was on a call with uh, Barbados uh, last week in the Bahamas, and there were like nine people on the call and I didn't recognize four of the names, right? So we start off in a small business just with some practices that are free. Everyone introduce yourself. And if you don't recognize that little name up there or an acronym or whatever, you know, you say, sorry, or someone's dialing in from a phone call, Hi, area code 242-123. Uh, can you just tell us right now, unmute yourself and tell us who you are? First, first things first, are the right people in the room and do you know everybody? And, and you're, 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 you're spot on, Pam. What um, I have seen and certainly um, when I sit down with, um, with leaders, whether they're the CTO, CEO, or CFO in the business, um, the first thing they say to me, they um, use a number of free services. So they will say, okay, you know, we've got uh, Teams or we've got uh, Zoom uh, and there, there are a number of other uh, different products there on the market and they are offering these services free. Um, in addition to that, um, I've seen a number of businesses use free VPN tools use free antivirus tools. The thing with a free service is that the free service was only designed to whet your appetite so you can get the more comprehensive service to secure your business. A free service is not saying we're giving you 
our intellectual capital for you to go away and, and do what you want to do and, 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 and have a great day, you know, bake the cake and eat it. The free service was only designed to give you the minimum requirements of that particular application and to give you some insight of what that third party or that business is capable of providing to you. So you should never have a free service as what you call, as you can see it, as an essential service. Why? Because you've got priorities, critical services running, and you certainly don't want critical services running on your minimum requirements when it comes to security, confidentiality, and integrity. You want, and people like us come in and we talk to, uh, we'll talk to you, Will, and we say, okay, um, tell me, uh, you know, give me an overview of what you're doing as a business. Based on our interaction with multiple businesses over the years, both small, medium, and, 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 and large, mm -hmm. based on our understanding of benchmarking and, you know, what other competitors are doing, we're able to suggest or recommend what we think would be the, part, the, the, the solution that would be best suited to your business. Now, this is very different from you going on the internet, Googling, and saying, mm -hmm. I'm looking for a VPN service, and using your knowledge to say what VPN service is good for me. Mm -hmm. Self-analysis self only works, but you need an independent source to verify your self-analysis is sufficient, meets industry requirements, and certainly yeah. meets the demand of what is going on in the marketplace. Yeah, and, and, to, and just to add on to that, um, what we find is, and I always tell everybody in the nine countries we work in in the Caribbean, is you know what, what definitely works in Boston is not gonna work in Barbados. What works in you know Toronto isn't like a good fit for Trinidad, right? So not everything. So basically, you know, Richard and I have had many conversations about what are the vendors and there's a question in the chat here about vendor you know risk concerns of vendor management well that's where any decent vendor and i'm going to say you can go to a place like forrester for examining if you want to do some research you go to forrester or gartner g-a-r-t-n-e-r -E they will tell you who the leading vendors are in that space if it's antivirus who's the top antivirus companies right and just for the small businesses when you buy a laptop you install an antivirus on it. You don't just let, you know, your Microsoft protect Microsoft. You, you layer something down to it. So as CISSP security professionals say, it's defense in depth and you put on layers. If you don't know which layer is right for your company, go to Gartner, go to Forrester, see who the top five players are. Um, and then you can go to them. Like, uh, you know, we, we are offering something free, but only from a trusted vendor, okay? And because we saw a lot of our customers out there, over 300 businesses in the region, that weren't having any type of web security. So we went back to one of our main products and said, hey, will you give our customers your stuff for free for 90 days during this pandemic? So normally that wouldn't be free, but it is. And there's a couple of, we leaned on a few of our global suppliers that we've worked with for 15 years and said, look, we are the Cayman Islands um, here in Cayman. We are that target. And there's a lot of people that don't have the layers they need. What can you give us to help them, you know, lock things down now and then start the conversation? And if they can't afford it afterwards, at least we know for the next 90 days, they were safe. And uh, we try to find things that, you know, IT managers don't always have to install, but um, you do need a decent IT consultant. Um, you know, and any business should be looking at cybersecurity now, as Will said, part of your budget, part of your plan. It's really important to put this in this remote world to start doing some best practices. So um, what, let me ask you a question. What's your view then on IP masking uh, in terms of, you know, these, some of these services that you can get where, you know, it, it, it kind of doesn't just let you, you know, those doesn't kind of, confirm where your IP is located and, um, you know, your internet protocol. I mean, are those dangerous? Do you, do you regard those as dangerous or is it something that can be an added layer to security or what's your view on that? Well, you know, I think Richard would probably talk to that better and then the oh. larger world for us, it's more of, you know, uh, hovering over a link to see if somebody says, um, this is coming from an IP 
or a domain that says it's um, Microsoft, but you hover over it and it's Joe's Garage. That's simple. But as for IP masking, I don't know, Richard, what's, what's your opinion on people that are trying to purchase or layer IP masking? I think that's, for me, that's further down the line from the front line. Yeah, and I think what, what we're going to see a lot more of IP, uh, we're going to see a lot more of IP masking going forward. And for the very reason that um, our IP address is considered personal identifiable information, a lot of websites are now allowing you to click to accept the cookies uh, so they can provide services, so the website can give you the best experience possible. But in doing so, they're going to collect a lot of data, personal identifiable information, including your IP address. So what we are seeing is that customers are taking the route, at least vendors and suppliers are taking the route and say, if we don't need to collect IP addresses, we don't want to collect IP addresses. We want to mask IP addresses out because that, that gives us another um, layer of protection that we need to put in place. If somebody comes to visit our website, we don't want to know who that person is particularly or where that person is um, uh, uh, logging on from. Because then if we collect your IP address by you just looking at our website, we have to put in place data privacy or GDPR procedures. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we're going to see a lot more of customers, vendors, not customers, vendors and suppliers saying, if we don't need to collect this data, we will not collect this data because things like GDPR mandates that mm -hmm. you have to comply and if you don't comply and there's a breach, you'll, be sick, you, you'll, you'll get a fine. And our law, the data protection law here, says exactly the same thing. So I think IP masking and a number of other services are going to be here to stay in terms of minimizing that impact on the controller who is, going to be, who is accountable to whether it is a supervisory authority or the ombudsman in collecting personal information. All right, well, does anybody else have any questions for, for our panel and Richard? Um, you know, just again, yes. thanks, thanks for your information very much. Um, Anson, Anson has put forward a, a, very good, a very good question here and he says, also vendor assessment is increasingly paramount, especially with regulators like uh, GDPR. What do businesses do to ensure that they cover all risk concerns with regards to vendor management? Excellent question. Um, I, I, I say this for all my customers. I said, if you are collecting personally identifiable information, you are defined as the controller, which means that you are accountable whether you are GDPR required, whether you need to, uh, to implement GDPR or comply with GDPR or the data protection law here in Cayman. What it does mean that if you share personal identifiable information with a vendor, the vendor is now responsible because he's classified as a data processor to operate in a certain way. Now the controller dictates what the vendor or data processor do because there's a data processor agreement that will be in place to give guidance to that processor, how you do certain things in compliance with the data protection law. So a number of businesses, would, it would be prudent for them to look at their vendor list and conduct a data management exercise to ensure that when they have agreements with vendors, that those vendors have the right environment in place in order to meet the requirements of the data protection law. A good example, if you are a small business and you're providing services uh, to the hospital during this pandemic, medical information is con considered what we call special information or sensitive information. So as a vendor, if you have access to that medical information, you need to understand what your requirements are. You need to also have in place the infrastructure to manage the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of that information as it complies to DPL. And you need to ensure that you're managing that data in compliance with the data protection agreement that you've signed with the controller. So vendor management, in my view, 
is going to be a huge challenge going forward once we see things such as data protection becomes embedded in the culture of businesses up and down the Caribbean and around the world. We see the California Act come in and there's a whole bunch of people getting sued right now. It, although, there's a, um, uh, although there's a pandemic and there might be some quote unquote discretions, but there are no discretions when something is the law. So um, thanks for sharing that uh, thought, uh, Anson. Uh, I, I think it's very important uh, that businesses understand that vendor management is critical in light of the data protection uh, regulations, which are now commonplace in, in the business environment. Well, if, if, there's a, if there's no further questions, I think we've, we've kind of had a great inter interaction, some discussions, and I know um, we're all busy people. So I just want to make sure that uh, last chance for questions, if you want to put them into the chat or, and again, both to Richard and Pam, thank you for your time and, and your expertise. Thank what you. would be great for, for, for me is, and also the whoever's on this call and, and others who may be watching in the future, is just send me some further information about your services. Um, that would be really great to share with, with our membership and other businesses I'd be interested because in, I think we were experiencing a new normal and mm -hmm. probably a, a worldwide transition to the world at work, uh, work at home, I mean. And yes. so that, that's going to be revolutionary, really, in many ways. And so in any revolution, there's, there's, a, there's a, you have to make sure you know the rules and make sure you're protecting your businesses and also your personal information. And so, again, if you could provide further information, I'm happy to share it with, with uh, our membership and then the daily watch that we've created to keep businesses updated during this crisis. Sure. Happy to look Fantastic. Time. Thank you. Thank so you. I'd like to thank both of you for participating in this webinar. I hope people have found it to be useful. And I wish everybody um, a good afternoon. And thanks again to both BDO and Pam for, for providing some good insight into this topic. Cheers. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.